Ooh, look at books. Here's your first book. This is my part two video about you alright honey? Good. Getting another book? That's important. I feel like as I've grown older and now that I'm raising my own kids, I look back on my childhood and there are just so many sweet memories that I have. Things that I did together with my parents. We had so much fun together and I'm just so grateful for... I'm just so grateful for all that my parents did to raise me to know and love the Lord. Last time I did a video highlighting so many of my special memories with my father and this video is going to focus on my mom. So I know I had four pages of notes and things on my dad. This time around I've got six on my mom so try to keep it concise as much as I can. These were blog posts that I did for my mom and my dad probably like three years ago. While we've been in quarantine missing family, I've been looking through old family photos and just thinking about all those wonderful memories and I thought I just want to make a video and just go a little more in detail on some of those memories and give more of the story. And so that's what I'm hoping to do here today. Ivy's taking my notes. But you have books, you don't need them, look. Uh-oh. Sit here with mama, look. Look what you did. Hi. We're gonna talk. Oh, she got it. Sometimes I can distract her and she won't. Oh, no, it's there. Let's see. There we go. There we go. Now you're gonna forget that your hair bows in. Yay! <laughs> Say hi, Grandma. Hi. Are you getting shy? <laughs> Think you need a nap. Oh, she got it again. <laughs> 10 months old and already over the hair bows. <laughs> Here's your baby doll. Oh, you're gonna put the hair bow on your baby doll. Uh-huh. So I will start here. When I'm out and about, I often get people who come up to me and say, I love your mom. She is just the sweetest lady. If they've watched her on the show over the years, they're always commenting on her patience and parenting and how gentle she is, how soft-spoken she is, and I have to say all those things are true. I've grown up just watching her and her patience, and as a mom myself now, it's something that I tell people all the time is, I pray for the patience of my mother. I feel like I'm not half as patient, but it's something that the Lord is working on in my heart and something that I definitely pray and strive for. My mom is very open about her life before she knew Christ, and when the Lord saved her at the age of 15, how he began that work of transformation in her heart. And I really think that that's the most attractive thing about my mom is that Jesus does just shine through her. People can see his love, feel his love. My mom is very engaging. She's always talking to people. When we were younger, we always wanted to go places with my mom. She would always be taking different ones of us kids whenever she would run errands. And so we would just have one-on-one -on -one time to just talk, or if we were at the grocery store, she would let us pick out a treat for like one dollar, something from the checkout aisle, or maybe a small jar of pickles or Pringles or something like that. We always loved going places with my mom, but when she started to get recognized more and more, we would always say, oh, I don't want to go to the store with mom because it takes her three hours to get in and out of the store. And it's actually true. Sometimes she would be in the store for like three hours, not because she was shopping that whole time, but just because if anybody said, Michelle, she would stop and talk to that person and take a genuine interest in them and people can feel that she cares for them. It's a beautiful, wonderful attribute of my mother and yet us kids would just think, oh, I don't know if I can bear being at Walmart for four hours. I just don't know. <laughs> Coming up with this list of things that I love about my mom was probably one of the easiest things I've ever done. She is a wonderful woman and I'm so blessed to call her my mom. I'm gonna read Proverbs 31 verses 28 and 29. Your children rise up and call you blessed, your husband also, and he praises you. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. That's really how I feel about my mom. There are just so many things that I love and appreciate about her, and so here is that list. Number one on the list is just having me, giving birth to me. I'm number five, and I'm so thankful to be here. I'm glad my mom didn't stop with four. I have a whole new appreciation for what she went through in labor and delivery, and so many times over. Giving birth is no small ordeal. I know people would tell me, oh, your mom, she must have had easy deliveries. Her babies must have just popped out, and that's not true. Johanna's labor and delivery was six hours, and that was her shortest, but most of her labors were in the teen hours. 
so quite long. Having babies now myself and going through that labor and delivery process really has made me appreciate my mom just so much more because that is no small ordeal. It's extremely painful, one of the hardest things you'll ever experience in your life physically. And yet, my mom would always talk about the joy of that reward when your baby is delivered. I know that's true. I've experienced it now three times for myself, and it is such a blessing to have these little ones in our lives, to be entrusted with them, to watch them grow and learn, and to purpose to raise them for the Lord and for His glory. Another thing that amazes me about my mom is how she can carry on with so little sleep. I think especially in our younger years, when she had babies that were up in the night and then little ones waking up early in the morning, older ones staying up late, she probably would run on four or five hours of sleep a lot of time. I would just think, Mom, how do you do it? How do you not get sleep? And she would just say, God gives us grace for the season that we're in. And I couldn't have imagined years ago that I would be able to do this, but God gives me grace for this season. And so those words have stuck with me and now that I'm in the season of sleepless nights with little ones and those types of things, those words come back to me and I just think, Lord, you give me grace for the season that I'm in and thank you for that grace. My mom would usually have us do what we call quick cleans twice a day in the house and so in the morning and then in the evening right before supper time we would have a quick clean of the house where everybody would run around and do their chores. My mom really wasn't uptight about things. She would let us make messes, she would let us be kids. We had boxes of craft supplies and we would pull those out and they'd be scattered all over the dining room. We had big buckets of blocks and of course you can't just pick them out. You have to dump the whole thing out to see what you have. So we'd scatter them all out and then you know, have to clean them up again. Some of my favorite memories were just ripping the couch cushions off, pulling blankets and sheets from the cabinets and making forts all over the living room. We would bring the dining room chairs in and we would have all these tunnels and passageways and pillows and blankets everywhere and my mom was just very relaxed about that and just let us be kids and so I really appreciate that. If it was raining outside and there was no lightning, my mom would let us go play in the rain. We would run out and splash around in puddles and get soaking wet and come in and out. When I was really little I remember saying, I'm cold, I want to stay inside now and so I would change and get all cleaned up and then I would see how much fun everybody was having again and I'd be like, I really want to go back out and she'd be like, okay, you can go and I would get another outfit soaking wet but I just love how relaxed my mom was about that. She would be like, you know what, we can just throw in a load or two of laundry later and the kids will have entertained themselves for an hour or two out in nature and that's great. Those are just some of the funnest memories, making those forts in the living room, playing out in the mud and the rain, and having fun as a kid. The house we lived in when I was a child had a lot of trees in the backyard. We had a lot of different fruit trees, like two apple trees, a pear tree, a peach tree, a cherry tree, a lot of big oak trees and other things. My mom would let us climb all the trees all the way to the very top. We only ever had one injury, Josiah broke his arm while climbing a pecan tree in cowboy boots. That was the only injury. He was a little guy and he was trying to snake out on a limb and fell and broke his arm. But other than that, it's amazing. We've really had no other broken bones. Jason fractured his jaw once. We've had a lot of like split heads and that type of thing just from like playing tag in the house and that kind of stuff. It's really a miracle we haven't had more broken bones in the family. Spurgeon started climbing trees now and my first thought is, be careful, don't hurt yourself, watch out, don't go too high. But I just remember my mom being like, wow, that's really impressive, you're pretty high up there, wow. You know, we learned to be cautious and careful, but my mom wasn't telling us, get down, you're gonna hurt yourself, and so we didn't have that constant fear looming over us. We built a little tree fort with some friends, and we just had the greatest times in that backyard. It was so much fun. My mom will forever be remembered for her purse that was massive and heavy. The purse was like stationary desk, first aid kit, hair supplies, fingernail clippers, anything and everything you can imagine, anything you would possibly need. We called it her 50 pound purse and we would always say, oh mom, we'll carry anything, we'll carry your coat, we'll carry, we'll carry the diaper bag, but the purse is too heavy, the purse is too much. <laughs> It was the super purse. If she would have done one of those videos of what's in my purse, it would probably take, you know, a good 45 minutes just to go through every little item in there. Not really. That might be a slight exaggeration, but we always knew if we needed anything, if we needed a hair tie, scissors, a stamp, mom had it. 
my mom would regularly have individual talks with us and just ask us lists of favorites. I remember if I would be out with her, just riding in the car, maybe on our way to the grocery store or something, she would be asking me, who are your best friends and who do you like spending time with right now? And maybe it was like asking me some things I was learning about in school. She always liked to know, what's your favorite candy bar right now? Or what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? A lot of these things she would just remember off the top of her head, but she would also keep a note on them. So, you know, she might write it down or keep a note in her phone for each one of us kids with lists of our favorites. So if she ever needed that for a birthday or just to get us a random special treat, she had our whole list of favorites there. That's just something really special from my childhood that my mom knew me so well, knew all of my favorites, and we keep up with those things. Leftover pizza. Every once in a while, my mom would order pizza for dinner. She would always order extra, so when we woke up the next morning, we could eat that for breakfast if we wanted. And I always loved that. She would just let us eat it cold if we wanted. I mean, some of the kids would microwave it and heat it up for 15 seconds or whatever, but I just love to eat it cold. One of the things that I'm most grateful for in my mom was her dedication to helping us memorize God's Word. I feel like now that I'm older, it doesn't seem nearly as easy as it did when I was a kid. Kids are just sponges. They just absorb these things. They soak it up so easily. My mom really prioritized that. In the afternoons from two to four, when the little kids would lay down for naps, my mom would gather all of us older ones together around the dining room table. We would have a time of singing together. My mom would teach us songs, and a lot of times they would be older hymns, and we would practice singing those together and memorizing the different verses. There's the dryer. And then we would memorize scripture. We didn't do a lot of random verses here and there. We did more passages, so getting the broader context. So I remember when I was young, we did Psalm 1, Psalm 23, Romans chapter 6. We memorized the Ten Commandments in Exodus. We memorized the armor of God, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. And then we memorized most of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And there were others, I'm sure, that I'm just not remembering off the top of my head. But I'm so grateful for that. That's something that Ben and I have started trying to do with our little ones. We've memorized Psalm 1, and we're working on Matthew chapter 5 right now with the boys. Those things are treasures to me. Those are things that I draw on now in my adult years. And even though as a young child I didn't comprehend it all, the older I got, the more it sunk in. My parents would talk about it being like a snow mound, and it kind of piles up. And then eventually that melts and starts to seep in. And that's really what it's been for me. When I'm experiencing a hardship, when I'm going through a difficult time, those words that I've memorized come back to me with new meaning. And they refresh my soul and it's been such a blessing for me. So I'm so thankful for that priority. Hey babe. Hey, How's it going? Good. She said daddy. Ivy. Did you hear daddy? Daddy's home. She's such a good little talker. She is. I cannot believe it. For her size, you know. Yeah. A little 10 month old. If I'm around, she just to say daddy. Daddy. Yeah, <laughs> that's cute. Something else I'm really thankful for is how my mom would always seek to find the underlying heart attitude behind a bad behavior. If a young one had taken a toy from a brother or sister, instead of just saying, don't take toys, she would talk to us about the heart attitude of selfishness. And she didn't think that those things were above our head. She knew that we had the ability to grasp those things and to understand those things. And so she would talk to us about those things. If somebody was speaking harshly, she would communicate about anger or resentment that we might be feeling. She would try to discern what was going on there, what was causing us to have those feelings, and help us think through those things and work through those things. And so I'm thankful that she wouldn't just address surface level, don't shout, don't take stuff, don't steal. She would always try to go deeper and a lot of times if there was a situation where somebody was doing something wrong or wasn't responding right to something, she would take time to communicate about that, even with little ones, you know, two, three-year-olds. She would just set aside five minutes and say, we're just gonna talk about this. She wasn't in a hurry to just correct it and move on. I'm thankful for that. My mom taking time to speak to our hearts and really draw us out. My mom loved to read aloud to us and us kids just couldn't get enough of that. 
Oftentimes in the evenings after we had family devotions, we would stay up for another hour and my mom would just read to us chapter books. Sometimes it would be stories like Little House on the Prairie or something like that, the Laura Ingalls Wilder series. Sometimes it would be biographies of missionaries or preachers or evangelists. And so we always enjoyed these. Some of them I remember were George Whitfield, Fanny Crosby, Amy Carmichael, Gladys Aylward, Allward, I don't know how you say her last name. David Brainerd, Susanna Wesley. My mom would set these people up as our heroes and people to look up to and people that we wanted to grow up and be like. It really gave us a vision of how God might use our lives if we lived yielded to him. I'm thankful for my mom's patience and how when she would get frustrated, she would purpose to lower her voice instead of shouting. I remember when I was probably six or seven, my mom had been reading to us, doing a little devotional with us on anger and she had read the verse in the Bible that says, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And also the verse that says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. And so my mom at that moment just paused and said, I fail in this area so much and I just wanna to apologize to you kids for speaking with harsh words. She said, God never meant for me to feel this way towards you, to feel upset and angry, to use sharp words. And so she apologized to us kids and that really made an impact on me, just seeing my mom. I remember she had tears in her eyes and she was just saying, I'm sorry, I've blown it. I know I've shouted and been upset and angry and I don't wanna feel this way towards you. And I'm gonna pray that God will help me. I had a very similar experience to that myself not too long ago. I have this big chalkboard that of all things I put Bible verses on. Okay, so I'm erasing this chalkboard and I had laid it out and put some cleaner on it and was gonna wipe it off in a second. And I look over and Henry's messing with the cleaner and just starting to scatter it. And so I, I couldn't get there fast enough, so I was shouting, Henry, don't do that, what are you doing? Don't touch that. And Spurgeon said to me, Mommy, I don't like it when you talk to my brother like that because you tell us not to shout, but you're shouting. It was the first time that I've had a child say to me, Mom, you're doing the wrong thing. You're having the wrong response. And I just remember saying, Oh, you're right. I am so sorry about that. Mommy does not want to be a shouting mom. I am sorry. I will ask God to help me and I will try to do better. I'm very thankful for that example of my mom just admitting, guys, I'm sorry, I blew it. And for her, she said, if a soft answer is what turns away wrath, then I'm gonna try to have a softer answer as I know how. So whenever she would feel herself getting frustrated, she, instead of raising her voice, would purpose to lower her voice and so she said I'm not gonna shout if I feel frustrated if you're doing something that I've asked you not to do or if you're disobeying or not coming when I've called you I'm not going to yell I'm going to lower my voice and I'm going to whisper so she implemented that that day and she has continued to do that if somebody's doing something wrong whisper hey you need to listen mom said don't do that or whatever and you know if mom is whispering, she means business. And it really does make sense if you think about it because if you're shouting, then that causes more anger and frustration and usually the child will raise their voice as well. But if mom lowers her voice and is quiet and almost whispers, that really helps to bring the emotion of the situation down and helps everybody to stay more under control. I'm thankful for that in my mom. My mom has always been somebody that I've known I can go to if I'm in a difficult place or if I just need someone to talk to or even just to ear to hear what I have to say. My mom would have a way of understanding if it was a situation where we really needed some advice or if we just needed a shoulder to cry on. And so I'm thankful for so many hours spent just discussing things with her and talking to her. She was very relatable in any season that we were in with anything we were going through. She could say, you know, I was once 10 years old or I was once 15 and I understand how that feels. I remember just bringing different situations to her and saying, somebody said this to me and this hurt my feelings or just talking about your body changing as you're getting older and you feel weird or whatever. She would just be very open about that and just say, you know, I remember what it was like when I was that age and share different stories or embarrassing moments of her own just to encourage us and help us to not feel like we were strange or weird or all alone in this. So she was very relatable in that way. I am thankful for my mom modeling hospitality for us. She would often have people into our home, sometimes once a week, have families in maybe on a Friday night. 
We would eat dinner together, play games, talk with them. A lot of times we would do like a massive batch of potatoes and then have a whole bunch of toppings to go on them. Or we would do chilies or soups or things like that to make it stretch for a large crowd. I mean, we were already a large crowd ourselves, so we were used to cooking for groups. A lot of times we would have one or two other families over and there may be easily 40 people in the house, but my mom just loved that. Just entertaining people, having them in, and mostly the conversations. Those are the things that stand out in my mind. If there were ever traveling missionaries or people coming through, we would always want to talk to them and ask them stories about how the Lord was working in the mission that they were a part of. If we had individuals or families over, we would usually be asking them, what do you do for work? Or what do you like to do in your free time? Or if they were fellow Christians, how did you come to know the Lord? If it was a couple, how did you meet and fall in love? And so, as a young child, I just remember getting to sit and hear so many stories that were so exciting. And I'm thankful for my mom facilitating that. Just encouraging us to get the house cleaned up and have people over. And we would be a part of getting to prepare and serve a meal to them. So those are some really special memories from my childhood. Oh, she just stood up. She just stood right up on the floor. My mom had and still has a poem in the house that describes love. Ivy. Okay, no, no, don't pull it. I'll put my feet on it. It won't go anywhere. In this poem, it says things like, love picks up the crying child before it wipes up the spilled milk. Love smiles at the tiny fingerprints on a newly cleaned window. If I live in a house of spotless beauty, but have not love, I am a housekeeper, not a homemaker. If I have time for cleaning and decorative achievements, but have not love, my children learn of cleanliness, not godliness. Some different things like that. But I just remember reading that and thinking, wow, my mom really does strive for love in this sense. She does smile at the tiny little fingerprints on a newly cleaned window. And so I'm thankful for that in my mom. My mom always kept extra pillows and blankets in her room. And if we came in and were scared in the middle of the night, I just remember so many times she would pull out those pillows and blankets and make a little pallet and we could sleep in there for the night. And that was just so comforting for us. And that's something Ben and I have done now too. We keep a little fold out mat in our room and pillow and blanket. And if one of the boys wakes up with a bad dream or something, then we'll pull that out and they can camp out there in our room for the rest of the night. When I think about potty training, we have one down. I've only potty trained once successfully so far. Spurgeon's potty trained. Henry, we've sort of started-ish. <laughs> so <laughs> I just think of my mom and the patience that it takes to potty train so many kids. It's such a hard thing. I mean, just thinking of all of the wet clothes she had to wash and then accidents at bedtime, nap time, all the sheets being washed. And yet she would never gripe at us. She would never give us a hard time, you know, having accidents or wetting the bed at like four years old, five years old and her saying, it's okay. Like, We've all had this whenever we were little and, you know, just never embarrassed or made us feel bad about that. Eventually they all outgrow it. I'm just thankful for her sweet spirit in that and her patience in that. Everybody remembers mom's family meetings. If mom called a family meeting, you knew it was a big deal. Sometimes it would just be to give us an update on something. Sometimes it was because we had a new family rule, such as putting a limit on how many people can ride on the golf cart at one time or something like that. Sometimes it was because somebody had done something and she decided, you know what, this would be a good time without naming that individual to go ahead and tell everybody, no, it is not okay to climb on the railing on the outside of the staircase or climb out on the beams in the middle of the house. That's not okay. So if mom called a family meeting, you knew it was something serious. Everybody better put their listening ears on and sit quietly and pay attention. And <laughs> I'm trying to think of some, some prime examples. No, you may not bundle together a whole bunch of bottle rockets and light them all at once. No playing with fire. <laughs> Sometimes it was things that we already knew she just wanted to reinforce. This is off limits and we're not going to do this. This is dangerous, we're not going to do that. So mom was great with calling her family meetings. It's a great way to do it. I mean, if you just tell one or two kids, there's always a chance that somebody didn't know and it's gonna be repeated. And so family meetings were mom's way of making sure we were all on the same page and we all understood this is okay and this is not. That's not the only reason why family meetings were called though. Sometimes it was, you know, she felt like she had had a bad attitude or responded wrong to something and she just wanted to call everybody together and make that right. Oftentimes family meetings would also be called if 
there was something urgent that she wanted all of us to gather together and pray about. If we found out that somebody was sick or somebody was in need of prayer for something, then oftentimes we would gather for family prayer. During our childhood, we loved being outside. We would go out in the rain, snow, shine, we would be outside a lot. But sometimes if it was raining and there was like lightning or if it was just really nasty and cold out, my mom would come up with creative, fun things to do indoors to help pass the time. So I remember stringing popcorn with a needle and thread and making jewelry and that was always so much fun. I remember so many times baking sugar cookies and that was great because we had the massive bucket of all the different cookie cutters and she would give us each our own ball of dough and we would get to roll that out and make our own shapes and we had sprinkles or sometimes icing and things to decorate them with once they came out of the oven. We'd even try out different kinds of cookies. Oatmeal cookies, we had a favorite oatmeal cookie recipe, chocolate chip cookies. We couldn't get quite as creative on the shapes with those but we had a lot of fun making those things. We would do personal pizzas. She would give us each our own ball of dough to make a pizza crust and then we would get to put on our different toppings. Choose our meat like ground beef or chicken or turkey pepperonis. We could choose different veggies, um, different kinds of sauce or different cheeses and so that was always really fun. We loved when we got to make our own personal pizzas. Sometimes she would pull out the craft buckets and we would make different pieces of art drawings, gluing things together, making cards for people. Mom just really had ways of making rainy days fun. My mom really purposed to speak praise publicly and speak words of correction privately, and I'm very thankful for that. If there was something that we did that was great and positive, she would praise us for that in front of others, and that really meant a lot. But if there was something that we had done, if we had a bad attitude or had done something wrong, she wouldn't call us out on that in front of other people. She would call us aside and say, hey, I need to talk to you about this and keep that private and just between us and her. I remember at times overhearing other moms talking about their kids, laughing about something that their child did, or just telling other people because they thought it was funny. But I never remember my mom doing that. I never remember hearing her talk about any of us kids. She would never name names or tell other people about embarrassing things. I'm thankful for that, that she would speak praise publicly but keep words of correction for private. I'm thankful for my parents' relationship. My mom and dad adore each other, always have, and they've always spoken highly to us kids of each other. And so I'm grateful for that. I never heard them putting each other down or jokingly calling each other names. They were just always sweet, affectionate. They had their cute little names that they'd call each other. I remember when I was younger, my dad would always call my mom Shelly. They were always hugging and kissing and holding hands and my dad would open the car doors for my mom and I'm just so grateful for their example of a loving relationship. My mom is an excellent bargain hunter. I just remember when I was younger, we would always wanna to go to the thrift stores or go to the store and look for clearance racks and we would always love bargain hunting with her. She is great at finding deals. A lot of times whenever you go to a thrift store or something like that, it can take longer to find what you need because a lot of times things aren't as organized and you're just having to pick through and search, but we would take a group of us in and she'd be like, all right, we need shirts for the 10 year old. So y'all can split up and we'll all look for it. It'd be like a big hunt. We would all look for what we needed or we need pants for the six year old. So everybody split up and look for that. We just browse through the racks and if we found something, she would let us pick out things. I look back and I think probably a lot of things that I picked out aren't that cool, but she would always say, oh, do you really like that? Yeah, hmm, yeah, maybe we could get that. And since it was a thrift store, you know, everything was fairly cheap. She would let us pick out things, like we love to pick out outfits for the babies. And even if it probably wasn't her style, she would let us have some freedom to make some of those choices and pick some things out for them. And so I loved shopping with my mom. For every Christmas, for as long as I can remember, my mom has done stocking, not stockings, but like bags. She'll always get us special treats. Used to be like Pringles, always get our own jar of pickles candy and then there have been some years recently where she's like okay we're gonna try to do healthier so maybe she'll try to do like beef jerky way less candy it seems like even though they say we're not gonna do candy this year we always end up with candy and especially now there are grandkids and stuff it's like I just don't think the candy thing's ever gonna stop but it's it's very endearing I think it's so cute so every year mom and pops do those stocking bags and that's just so sweet and such a fun tradition. Now it's funny, we do Christmas gift exchange and every member in the family has one other person that they're buying for and it's just a way to be able to get more meaningful gifts and cut down on the costs. It's so funny, my parents will always say, oh this year we're really gonna scale back, we're gonna do a lot smaller Christmas. But 
they have a hard time doing that. So it seems like, you know, about a week before Christmas or just days before Christmas, I'll hear the kids say, oh, they did it. Mom and Pop's been out shopping again. They usually go out like two or three times, make these big shopping trips, and they get more and more stuff. And we're like, Mom and Pop's like, I thought we were going to do a smaller Christmas this year. Oh, yeah, yeah, we are. So <laughs> it's really sweet. I mean, a lot of times they think practical. So like this last year, they got everybody a new pillow. So all of us kids plus our spouses, grandkids, everybody got a new pillow. A few years before that, they did toolkits for all of the guys. So they do try to think practical a lot of times, but then sometimes it'll be like, oh, six pogo sticks. Oh, I can imagine busted teeth already. Or, <laughs> or they'll get like just fun little things for the kids and the grandkids. Yeah, so every year they say it's going to be a small Christmas this year, and then they end up going out and buying some of these things, but it keeps it fun and definitely there are lots of surprises. Whenever we would catch a sickness, it would sometimes go through the whole family and there were just so many nights where my parents would hardly get any sleep because they were up with one child cleaning up, throw up, and then 30 minutes later, another child cleaning up, throw up, giving baths, hugging, asking us how we were feeling. My mom had certain things that she would always do to just cheer us up whenever we didn't feel well. If we were sick, especially if it was a stomach bug, she would cover a corner of the couch with a big blanket and that would be our space to sit. And she would just wait on us and all the kids would just wait on us, bring us a glass of water. We would have our big bucket that we would use like ice cream buckets or cups or whatever, have it there just in case we got nauseous. And then our big thing was when you're sick, you get to have popsicles. So my mom would keep those skinny little freezer pops. Or sometimes like if somebody got hurt, like split their lip open or stub their toe or something, they would sometimes get to have a popsicle. When you were sick or hurting, that's what popsicles were for. Sometimes we would have popsicles for summer treats, but if you were sick, that was like, this is your stash. You can have whatever you'd like. I remember one time a stomach bug had just started and all of us kids had just fallen asleep. I woke up and I remember being just half awake. I was probably like seven years old. And I heard my parents, they were like, oh, she threw up. And they were cleaning up. One of the siblings had thrown up. They said something about popsicles. And I sat up in bed and I said, but she can't have as many as she wants. And I laid back down and they just thought that was hilarious. They would tell that story all the time. They're like, that's so funny. Like, we didn't even know you were awake and you just popped up out of bed and said, but she can't have as many as she wants. I guess I didn't want the stash to run out. I figured I wanted her to save some for me. My mom was definitely more concerned with caring for us in our need than she was even with protecting herself from getting sick and so she would hug us and hold us and cuddle us even when we didn't feel well knowing that that would increase her risk of getting sick but she did it anyway and so I'm so thankful for that. When we did have a sickness go through the family my mom would keep a medicine chart and she'd put names at the top. She would write the time and like Tylenol or ibuprofen or whatever she had given us. She would keep this long running chart so she never missed anybody's meds. She would set like a stopwatch or an alarm so she would know exactly when to give meds. I've had to do that before for two kids at a time but I can't imagine doing it for a dozen or more kids at once because sometimes we would all come down with things at the same time. Out of all the babies, I can only remember one of them having colic and just crying a lot. And it seemed like it was probably three months that this little one had a hard time being consoled and would just be crying a lot in the night. But even if the baby doesn't have colic, you're still getting up a lot in the night. And so I just think my mom was amazing. Just the endurance to keep on going. Get up in the night, feed the baby or babies if it was twins. Sometimes I know she'd be running on minimal sleep. My dad would do what he could to help out. but couldn't really feed the babies, but she would always carry on with a joyful attitude and a joyful spirit. I do remember her saying at times like, oh, mom is tired, I just need to have a nap. And my dad would sometimes insist, no, Michelle, you need to go lay down and, and take, a, take a nap for a few hours. So sometimes she would do that. But I never remember her using her lack of sleep as an excuse. Like if she had a bad attitude or something like that. I know I'd, I tend to do that be like, well, I'm just tired. I, that's why I'm grumpy. I'm just tired. I just need more sleep. But I never remember my mom doing that. I often will think back, just how did she do it? <laughs> She's an inspiration. She's really an inspiration to me. Whenever I think that I'm in the thick of it, or I'm tired, or I'm exhausted, I just think, 
but by God's grace, my mom did it, so by God's grace, I can do it. All throughout my parents' relationship, they've always been very giving and looking for ways to minister to others and bring them into their lives. Early on in their marriage, they took in a few people that were homeless and just needed a place to stay for a time, and we're just trying to help them get back on their feet. They helped out with the church bus ministry, and week after week would just bring people to church. They would help lead Bible studies and even in their home for years hosted Bible study once a week, having people in. My mom's life is just marked by hospitality and love and genuine care for other people. Giving to others needs, whether financially or emotionally, spiritually, always seeking to do others good. I'm thankful that my mom never allowed us kids to speak hurtful words to one another or to tease one another. Sometimes the, the ones dishing it out, they don't mean harm, they just feel like it, they're doing it in jest. But when you've been on the receiving end, you know that those words can sting and can cause deep hurts. And so I'm thankful my mom wouldn't put up with that. <laughs> Not for a minute, she would say, we don't need to talk like that. You need to treat other people how you would like to be treated. And that's unkind. And those words do hurt. I remember there was an instance once where I had done something to offend a sibling. And that sibling had gone to my mom and was crying about that and my mom came and talked to me. We probably had a good 15 or 20 minute conversation. My mom was just addressing with me like, Jessica, you, you have to be so careful with the words that you speak and realize that those things hurt and those things sting and this sibling, they're younger than you. They look up to you. You've got to think before you speak and it's a struggle for us all. But if we'll ask the Lord to help us, he can help us control our tongue. I'm thankful for that. Another thing I'm thankful for is if we ever brought concerns to my mom about somebody else. Like we had a friend who we felt was making wrong decision in something or we had been hurt or offended by somebody. If we were ever talking negatively about somebody else, my mom would and still does to this day say, you know what, we've been talking about this, but you know what we really need to do? We need to pray about this. And she would say, let's pray right now. And we would stop and we would pray for that person. And there's something really powerful about that because I feel like naturally as humans, we're just good at talking about things, but it's important to go a step further and take that to the Lord and ask him to work in their life and change their heart or ask him to help them grow in an area where they need some growth. Maybe they're lacking in love or in gentleness or in kindness. And so we can ask the Lord to bless them with those character qualities. So my mom would always try to point us back to that and say, let's take this to the Lord in prayer. And I'm thankful for her example in that. That still comes back to me to this day. Even as an adult now, when I'm talking to Ben about somebody or thinking about something or just a difficult situation or whatever, my mom's words come back to me. Well, we've talked about it, but you know what we really need to do is pray about it. And so I'll say that and then I'll stop and pray together. And It's just a great reminder to me. Another way that I think of that my mom loved others well and gave to others when they needed it most was when people would have a new baby. Even though she had so many little ones of her own and so many mouths to feed, she would always be the first one to sign up to take them a meal and a lot of times organize those. This is back before the days of meal train. So she would literally print off a calendar page for the month and do the phone calls and get everybody's dates written down and what meals they were bringing and give that to the new mom. And she would organize the meal train before it was as easy as just sending out a link. And she still does that a lot to this day, just doing that for new moms. And so that's really sweet and a kind gesture. With homeschooling, I know my mom experienced just about every type of learning style possible. Some that were very self-motivated, others that were not so much. Some that just caught things quickly. Even some that have like learning challenges and so she was very creative and wasn't afraid to switch up curriculum and customize it for each child's needs. I remember a particular season where there were some of us who needed some extra tutoring and one-on-one -on -one time and she said, all right, we're gonna make a goal. We get up early in the morning and there was a Burger King close by that would open up early in the morning. And so we would drive there, we would sit inside and she would order like a couple of orders of tater tots and just have some one-on-one -on -one tutoring time with those kids and we just thought that was so cool. Another thing I'm grateful to my mom for is teaching me how to cut hair. I'm definitely not a professional, but my mom had a sister who was a beautician and so she had taught her some different things and my mom would give us the clippers. I think when I was probably nine or 10, I remember cutting the little boy's hair like Josiah, Jedediah, Jeremiah. Well, they're not little anymore. <laughs> they're all in their 20s. I remember getting to to try my hand at cutting their hair. Back in the day, I only did the buzz cuts, but that was the start of my love for cutting hair. And then as I got a little bit older, my mom taught me how to cut with the scissors and to blend and all that. And so 
I'm thankful to my mom for teaching me those skills. Having so many younger brothers and sisters, we just thought it was the greatest thing. I mean, especially for us girls, we were like, this is like a live baby doll. This is so exciting. And so my mom would always let us pick out the outfits or help feed a baby their first foods and be part of those milestones. And so even if outfit didn't quite match or if it would have been way less messy if my mom had fed the baby their baby food, she would let us try those things and we just thought it was the most wonderful thing, getting these live baby dolls. We would joke like, who needs fake baby dolls whenever you can love and cuddle on the real deal? I just think of all the loads and loads of laundry and the sink after sink full of dishes that my mom and dad did back in the day, really before any of us were old enough to help out. And I feel like Ben and I are sort of in the thick of that right now, but I can't imagine that like five times over. You know, all of the noses wiped and boo-boos bandaged and faces kissed and teeth brushed and hair fixed and all of that. Probably seemed like for about 20 years, every time that my mom turned around, she was doing one of those things. But she'd do it with a smile on her face and she really did just enjoy her kids. She enjoyed the younger years. She enjoyed each season. And I'm sure some were harder than others, but she really did just enjoy her kids. I remember whenever she had just had the second set of twins, so that would have been babies number 10 and 11, she had this big box of puzzles that she would pull out whenever she was sitting down to nurse the twins and she would put the puzzles out on the floor for me, Ginger, Joseph, Saya, Joy. We could all sit there and play with puzzles while she fed the babies and so, if, especially for like the toddlers and they wouldn't be running off and getting into mischief. The puzzle box was always a special treat and I've thought about that. I'm like, that's something that I need to collect is like just have my puzzle box. So when I need the kids to all stay in one place, and stay entertained, just put out the puzzle box. And it was only used for that time, so it was a very special thing. I'm thankful that my mom would encourage our own individual strengths and not compare us as siblings. Wouldn't say, well, look at your sister or you need to be more like so-and-so. She wouldn't compare us to one another, but she would really just encourage us to be the best that we could be, to pursue our own gifts and talents and abilities and she just really appreciated us as our own individual and unique person. I'm thankful for the example that my mom gave of even when we were all in those younger years and life was busy and crazy, she would still reach out to other moms. Some in the same season of life as her, some with fewer and younger kids, younger moms needing an older mom. She'd prioritize that. I think she's really the example of a Titus II woman there. I know so many women who would just look up to her as an example of a woman who loved the Lord and loved their family well. And I'm thankful for her example in that. It's even an encouragement to me that in this season, even whenever life seems busy and crazy with all these little ones, she didn't have this mindset that, well, ministry has to wait. No, ministry can be as simple as bringing people into your lives, letting them see the mess, letting them see you referee a fight and then encourage apologies. That can be discipleship for the younger mom. And so that's been an encouragement for me in this season that we really, as women, we need less of the perfect role models and we need more real life. We need more moms encouraging other moms and just saying, hey, I'm in the thick of it. This is a hard season, I get it. And yet God's grace is there for us. And then just watching that on display. And so I know my mom was that for so many other young moms and continues to be that for me. And I'm so thankful for that. When my mom's father was in a car accident and his health was deteriorating, he moved into our home with us and lived with us for a time. And my mom absolutely loved having him there. She would just care for him so tenderly. And of course he had certain things that he loved to eat. And so she would always shop for his favorites and prepare his meals, especially for him, just the way he liked it, just helping him with everything. I mean, it's hard to see a loved one in declining health, but she graciously would just care for his every need, help bathe him, dress him, and she counted it a blessing and a gift to be able to give back to one who had given so much to her. And so I'm so thankful for that example of selfless and giving love. If we would ever question something about the way we were being raised, I remember my mom's response not being, well, because I said so, like we just do, this is just the way we do it. She would always be pointing us back to God's word and saying, this is the foundation for how we wanna live our lives and we don't do everything perfectly and we understand that and as you grow up and if the Lord allows you to be married and have a family of your own one day, it's not gonna look exactly like ours, but that's okay. She would always just point us to God's word and encourage us to search the scriptures for ourselves and come to our own personal convictions. I'm so thankful for her pointing me to God's word most of all, I'm thankful for her explaining salvation to me. 
I remember her often sharing her own testimony of how she came to the Lord at the age of 15. Just the weight of knowing that she was a sinner and then the understanding of God's grace and what that meant for her life. That we're created for a relationship with a holy God and just the baggage in her own life from feeling guilt, from lying or being deceitful and explaining that we're not saved by works. It's not a matter of our good outweighing our bad. We could never do enough good to earn our salvation. But Jesus Christ has lived the perfect life that none of us could live. And when we repent of our sins and trust in Him, His righteousness is laid to our account. His righteousness covers us like a cloak and the judge can look at us and say, not guilty. And through Jesus Christ and His sacrifice on behalf of sinners that we can now be reconciled to God and have a personal relationship. I'm thankful for her explaining sanctification as well that you know, when we become a Christian, that doesn't mean that we're instantly free of sin and perfect. We do fail and we fall short every day. And often she would tear up while sharing that, just expressing her love for Christ. And it's only by God's grace. I'm thankful for my mom sharing that with us consistently over the years. I'm thankful for her prayers for us, deep prayers, specific prayers. I'm thankful for all the years and years when she memorized scripture with us and read God's word to us. So I'm so grateful to my mom for all of these things and more. So mom, I wanna thank you for showing us the unconditional love of a mother. And in this way, representing the unending, unfailing love of our savior, Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful for you and so blessed to call you my mom.